Hello, all. I want to welcome you to the 17th Annual Swartz Mind Brain Lecture. My name is Lorna Roll. I'm the chair of the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior, as well as one of the co-directors of Stony Brook Medicine's new Neurosciences Institute. The Department of Neurobiology has the honor of serving as the local host for the Mind Brain Lecture each year. To introduce you to this 17th Annual Swartz Foundation sponsored event, I would like first to give you a bit of background about Jerry Swartz and the Swartz Foundation. Jerome Swartz, who is a dual adjunct professor with our Departments of Electrical Engineering and Applied Mathematics and a board member at both Stony Brook University and Cold Spring Harbor Labs, co-founded Symbol Technologies and served as its chair and chief scientist. In 1999, with his development of PDF-417, the high-capacity two-dimensional barcode symbology, and his invention of the portable laser barcode scanner, Dr. Swartz led Symbol Technologies to win the National Medal of Technology, the U.S.'s highest honor for technology innovation. The award was presented to Swartz by President Clinton at the White House in 2000. In 2000, Swartz was also elected a member of the National Academy for Engineering for distinguished contributions to that field. In 1994, Swartz established the Swartz Foundation for Computational Neuroscience to, quote, explore the application of mathematical physics and computer engineering principles to traditional neurobiology as a path to better understanding the brain-mind relationship. The foundation supports a number of research initiatives, including five Sloan Swartz Centers for Theoretical Neurobiology and six additional Swartz Centers for Computational Neuroscience, including a center at Cold Spring Harbor Labs. For Stony Brook University, Swartz has established the Mind Brain Lectureship, an annual two-day event which has brought highly distinguished neuroscientists and non-neuroscientists, or so they claim, to visit with the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior, with neuroscientists throughout the university and the School of Medicine, and most importantly, to deliver this honorary lectureship to you, the Stony Brook community at large. Today's 17th annual Swartz Mind Brain Lecture is Dr. Michael Wiggler from Cold Spring Harbor Labs. I want to take a few more moments of introduction to give you some background on this highly accomplished and internationally renowned biomedical scientist who has recently turned his laser-like intelligence to discovery in the arena of the genetics of autism spectrum disorders. Dr. Wiggler received his BA in mathematics at Princeton University and his PhD in microbiology at Columbia University. Since 1978, Dr. Wiggler has been a full professor of mammalian cell genetics at Cold Spring Harbor Labs, where he is currently the chair of quantitative biology. Since 1988, he's also been an adjunct professor in the Department of Genetics at Columbia Physicians and Surgeons, and since 2008, an adjunct professor at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. Dr. Wiggler's many significant contributions to the field of genetics have been recognized by his receipt of multiple prizes, including the NIH Outstanding Investigator Award, the American Cancer Society's Lifetime Research Professorship Award, as well as awards from Pfizer, Sibigaygi, and Memorial Sloan Kettering. Dr. Wiggler was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 1989. He is also an elected member of the American Academy of Microbiology and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Wiggler's distinguished career includes numerous discoveries, but in particular the discovery of the RAS oncogene and the development of over 30 patents in the field of biomedical science and cancer therapeutics, including the 1983 patent with doctors Axel and Silverstein for methods of transfection of DNA into eukaryotic cells. In 2007, Dr. Wiggler began his paradigm-shifting work on the genetics of autism spectrum disorders. We are privileged today to welcome Dr. Wiggler as the 17th Swartz Mind Brain Lecturer. Uh, it was a great honor to be uh, invited to give this lecture. Um, 
I did it with a certain degree of uh, misgivings um, since they're mind-brain lectures. And um, I'm not a neurobiologist. I don't really think about issues of mind. I'm a molecular biologist and geneticist. Um, but I thought I could make an interesting story out of autism. And so um, I accepted um, the offer to give a talk. Uh, Stony Brook, of course, is a very special place for me. It's a neighbor of where I work, which is Cold Spring Harbor Lab. Um, I've had many graduate students, fine graduate students, uh, from here. My brother was an undergraduate here, and my son Benjamin was, uh, an, was an undergraduate here for, for, for a full year. So I'm really happy to have been invited and happy to be able to uh, accept and, and give this talk. Um, the talk is going to be about the genetics of autism. Uh, I want to explain you know, very briefly why we, what we hope to do by understanding genetics. Um, first is to understand the disorder itself. It's uh, one of the most profound um, behavioral cognitive uh, disorders in humans. And to understand it is probably not possible without understanding um, how the brain works, and um, that's the first goal. And the second goal is to be able to provide, eventually, uh, clinicians with the tools for early diagnosis of the disorder so that treatment can begin at an early age. And the third goal is, um, ultimately, by defining the genetics, possibly to open the pathway to therapeutics. Um, and it's often the case um, in biology that there are problems that are enigmas, and they really begin to yield under the uh, fine dissecting uh, power of genetics. So genetics is the right approach to take. Um, one of our aims is to see what amount of the autism incidence can be explained by genetics, and that will be the main focus of my talk. So how much of, of autism do we now, can we now attribute to genetic mechanisms that we know about? And what's left over? What is it that we can't explain? So that's, that's the main focus of the talk. Secondarily, um, the genetic targets that cause autism turn out to be an interesting class of targets. Uh, they tell us something about the biology, perhaps something about, perhaps even something about the mind. And the third is um, the puzzles, the things that we don't understand, which I think will require uh, some new thinking about how organisms develop. Okay. So um, that's what the lecture is about. And I want to, um, it's not a dumbed down lecture in any sense. Um, it's been um, denuded of some of the technical aspects of our work. Or the work we do is extraordinarily technical, so when you see numbers of things. Behind those numbers is an extraordinary amount of work by very smart people to make sure that the numbers that we're going to discuss are as good as we can make them. Um, but they are just numbers, and um, a lot of what we're going to talk about involves statistical inference. I will not drag you through the methods of statistical inference, uh, but I hope you'll trust me, at least for the purposes of this lecture. Um, so it's not going to be um, dumbed down, and it, but it's and it's, it's not going to be easy, but I think that um, since I'm sort of an amateur, um, I think that anybody who has an interest in methods of inference, uh, how you use evidence to reason about things, should be able to follow, um, follow the talk. Okay. So we'll just quick, quickly review uh, what, um, what's known and accepted about autism. Um, it's a developmental disorder of the social brain um, of a particular type, which means it's something that affects children, affects children early. Uh, they often have problems in communication. There's gaze avoidance. Um, there's almost an inability to understand the other. Um, it's probably also an inability to understand the self, but we, that we can't see, we're not privy to. We are privy to a difficulty in understanding the other. And it's also often accompanied by obsessive uh, behaviors, um, 
intense interest in um, subjects to the uh, disinterest in virtually everything else and repetitive behaviors. Um, there is a large excess uh, of males over females in this disorder, um, depending on how autism is defined. It's not, it's not a terribly well-defined disorder. Um, it's a ratio of about four males for every girl that's diagnosed. And it's known to be, have a strong genetic component because monozygotic twins um, have nearly a 90% concordance uh, for diagnosis. And that makes it, of all the um, behavioral cognitive disorders, probably the most highly penetrant, most highly determined by uh, your genetic composition. And your sibling risk is, goes up. So the incidence of autism in the population is maybe 1% of children born. But if you have um, a brother with autism and then you're born, your chances go up at least tenfold. And we'll talk a lot about that. Um, and it uh, has comorbidity with a lot of other syndromes, fragile X, Rett syndrome, Cowden's tuberous sclerosis, um, chromosomal uh, abnormalities. All, have some purport, all of these have some proportion of producing children with a diagnosis of, of autism. So the further evidence, these things, which are genetic disorders, that autism is, in fact, um, has a major contribution in, from uh, the component of genetics. Other important facts, and I'm giving you facts that obviously we're going to be addressing, um, are that the incident of autism goes up with the parental age. It goes up twofold uh, for every 20 years of life. And um, it has an increasing incidence in the population, which is a public concern. Um, I think most people who work in the field uh, think that this is because the diagnostic criteria have changed. Um, people are becoming more aware of it. Um, one of the most interesting statistics is that the probability that your child will be diagnosed with autism is related to whether you know any other families that have autistic children. So um, the increase in incidence is also accompanied by a decrease in incidence of mental retardation, which strongly suggests that the real incidence is not increasing. Um, and there's a lot of um, public heat. Did I make that noise? Public heat on the issue of the role of environment, in particular, for example, vaccines. So um, only a fool will, will, will rule out um, environmental factors. Um, scientists um, are also among fools. Um, but some scientists um, can rule out some of these things. And I think vaccines, as a major uh, causal factor, has largely been um, debunked, um, but it, nevertheless it rises zombie-like every once in a while, and there are still people who uh, won't have their children vaccinated because of fears of, of, of reactions to the vaccines. And I'm not saying that's totally unfounded, but it's not a major factor in autism incidents. Okay, let's see. So. Um, I think we can skip the personal timeline. Well, no, we shouldn't because it's part of the narrative. So I became interested in, um, in this disorder around the time when we developed. I was always interested in it because as a child I had encountered a ch another child with, with Asperger's. Um, and as our genetic tools, which we were developing to study cancer, became strong enough, I realized that we could apply these to genetic diseases. And in particular, we could study genetic diseases where there was a strong component of new mutation contributing to the disorder. Geneticists traditionally have, have ignored new mutation. Most geneticists count themselves as operating in the domain that, of Mendel uh, and, and Hunt and um, think about disorders as being the result of transmission of some genetic variety. The reason that new mutation had been ignored, there's a blind spot for it, was that the techniques for looking for them were difficult. And the tools that we developed for studying cancer were precisely the tools needed to find new mutations uh, in a population. So that's how um, I became interested in, in autism, and this is sort of, sort of a timeline. Our work became uh, 
in earnest when we, um, by coincidence, uh, Jim Simons, who is interested in funding autism research, and I were talking, and he liked some of our ideas and decided to fund us, and that enabled us to do um, a number of striking things. The first was to use the genetic tool uh, that we developed for cancer, which measures copy number fluctuations, that is changes in the genome where a whole section of the genome is duplicated or deleted, um, and to show that the human gene pool contained lots of mutations of that form, deletions and duplications. And in 2003, we published this finding and postulated that this kind of mutation would be fairly a common as a new mutation and might account for some genetic disorders, particularly pediatric disorders. Why pediatric disorders? Because a mutation of that type might be so grievous that that child um, would, ne would not grow up to transmit it, so that a, nu a number of pediatric syndromes should be caused by, mainly by new mutation as opposed to inherited factors, and autism fit into that category. By 2007, we had demonstrated that in children with autism, there was an excess of this type of mutation compared to normal people. Um, and we began to formulate uh, some theories that connected transmitted autism and autism caused by de novo mutations. And I'm actually going to start um, my story there, which is somewhat historically in the middle. Um, let's see. Oh, dear. Have I already broken this? No. I'm just not being intelligent. Okay. So for, for many years, um, geneticists studying autism were interested in um, collecting families that had multiple autistic children. And that's because the geneticists were Mendelians, and they were hoping to find long, large pedigrees. Large pedigrees are usually the way uh, geneticists get a toehold. Uh, into a disorder. There's a lot of information of transmission genetics. Not the right kind of families that we wanted to study. We wanted to study families that had what's called sporadic autism, that had, maybe there was a large family with only one autistic kid. But in the um, collection um, of data on families with multiple autistic kids, there was a huge clue that nobody had seen before um, lying in plain sight. So I mentioned that um, if you have a prior sibling with autism, your risk of having autism is higher. It's about, at the time, it was thought to be about 10 percent. And based on that, geneticists, transmission geneticists said that autism was a result of, gee, maybe eight genes, multiplex, uh, multiple genes required to form autism, because sibling rate was only 10 percent. Um, but they neglected to look at, a, at another statistic, which is, what if you had two previous children? Um, two previous siblings with autism, then your risk of having autism in that family is about 50 percent. That's a number that had been ignored, and we, we looked for it because we, were, we suspected we would find it. And in fact, when a third-born child is born in a family where the first two children are affected, if the child is a boy, um, 42 of 44 were affected, less for girls because girls are resistant. So. There are high-risk families in which the incidence of autism is behaving like a dominant mutation, as though it's a single gene that's being transmitted. Now, the overall thing to look at is, is, um, are these three numbers. One is the incidence in the population, which is about one in 100. The other is the incidence if two previous kids already had autism and you're a boy. Then your chances are about 50 percent. And your sibling risk, which is now thought to be around 25 percent, what could give you this? Turns out that this is a, um, a problem, it's a mathematical problem known as the truncated Hausdorff problem, Hausdorff moment problem. You have a risk function for the, fa for the families that represent the risk of the population. Some families are low risk, some families are high risk, but when you take, when you don't have enough information and you're averaging, which is what people had done, um, you're getting something that's intermediate between these two. So there is a simplest model that's consistent with this data, and um, here it is, that there are low-risk families um, that comprise the majority of the population and a small number of high-risk families, 
the probability of getting autism if you're in a low-risk family is quite low, uh, below one in 100, and 50%, about this is somewhat of a cartoon model. Um, and you have to throw in that um, females are resistant to being diagnosed, about one quarter. So this, these simple population assumptions then explains high risk and low risk autism as, as being two separate classes. And we puzzled over uh, what we call now a unified genetic theory, um, which is our first form of it was depicted here, that in sporadic autism, a mutation occurs, say, in the father's ger germline. And um, one of the children, say a boy, inherits from the germline. So the father does not have autism because he doesn't have it in, his, in every cell of his body. He just has it in his germline. Inherits from the germline that mutation, causing him to have autism. For familial autism, there has to be a carrier state. And we postulated that the carrier state could be a female. So again, lightning strikes. The father gets mutation in the germline, passes it to the girl. Three quarters of, a three quarters of the time, the girl does not show autism. She's now a carrier when she becomes a mom, and her, her male children um, show the disorder. So this is um, one of the models that has in it an explanation of these two risk classes. There is another sort of model that we've begun to think about, and for reasons that are a little complicated, I can't go into the reasons why we like it, but um, it's very similar in that it explains how you get to a carrier state. So, we postulate that certain couples have a curse. There's some incompatibility with them, um, which makes their children fragile. When the mutation is, uh, occurs in the father's germline and is passed on, you get these children. These are still low-risk families, but the child develops autism. When that mutation occurs, and this couple do not produce fragile children, the mutation occurs in the germline, it can be passed on, there can be a healthy carrier who pairs and develop children with this fragile condition. And then, these, and then this uh, uh, genotype is passed on in a dominant way and the phenotype appears in a dominant way. So either of these models, maybe both are correct or partially correct, um, can account for this rather simplistic idea of dividing autism into two risk classes, low risk and high risk. Um, now, I'm going to be talking about genetic findings, not of the type where the family is a multiplex with multiple affected kids, but families with only one affected kid. And these, this collection was uh, made by the Simons Foundation, um, largely at our urging. Uh, it was the ignored part of the uh, autism incidents. Um, but for us, it was the important part because it contained um, autism from low-risk families, whereas to pick autism from multiplex families, let me just back up. I believe this is it. Yeah. So population at, the lar at, at large, 99% um, um, are low-risk. 1% uh, are high risk. If you only have a single autistic child, and that's all you know, uh, that family could be low risk or high risk. If you've got two, 99% chance that it's a high risk family. The previous collections were of this type, and what we wanted to study were these guys. So we had to go to um, simplex collection, uh, families with only one kid that has autism, but most families are small, two kids. And half the time, uh, the, the child is a girl. So in the simplex families, there will be high-risk families. There will be low-risk and high-risk in the simplex collections. And there's a signature that we expected to see, namely that there would be more girls in the healthy siblings than boys because there was selection, ascertainment bias for simplex. And the amount of, of bias was exactly what we predicted by our model, which made us feel good. 
And the net of it is that in the simplex collection, we estimate 60% are from low-risk low families and 40% are from high-risk families. So everything that I'm going to tell you needs to be conditioned by the fact that we're looking at high-risk and low-risk populations mixed in some ratio, which we think is something uh, of the order of 60 to 40. Our first tool was to look for copy number mutation, and this is an example of tools that are now outdated, but this, these are copy number profiles from a family. Uh, the father and mother are probably in blue and, and uh, red. Maybe there's a sibling in here, I can't tell. And here's one of the child, one of the children. It has a increased copy, a, a larger copy number for some gene, polygram 2. You don't see that in either parent, so there's one major way that could have arisen, and that's by new mutation. There are other ways that could have arisen, but um, we, we had to rule those out, and that's a technical point. So this is an example of a new mutation of a copy number sort, and our tools were very good at finding these. Um, each little piece of data is a measurement over one probe into the genome. This is a fairly large event. Here's a smaller event. The data is more sparse because it's expanded. Same deal, um, this is a deletion. The child had only one copy of a gene present in, in the parents as two copies. This was our first tool. This gave us our first insight um, into new mutation as a cause for autism in low-risk families because we saw um, about 8% of autistic children had a new mutation of this type in only about 2% of their healthy siblings. Those mutations um, were scattered all over the genome, but there were some pileups. That is, there were recurrent events. Two of the most important ones occur at 16P, a, a deletion or a duplication, either of which could give you autism, and very significantly the same disturbance it can be found in patients with schizophrenia, but not an autism diagnosis. It can be found in patients with mental retardation. It can be found in patients with bipolar disorder or obsessive disorders. So we'll come back to that. That's a very important finding that was done, um, made at the Broad Institute and um, by Jonathan Sabat when he was still at Cold Spring Harbor. Another interesting locus is the Williams locus on chromosome 7. That's a recurrent locus. Williams is a fascinating uh, disorder. It's uh, caused by a deletion on chromosome 7. And the children with Williams are, are they're mentally retarded. They're extremely uh, friendly. They're verbally precocious. They generally never learn how to tie their shoes. And in math, they're horrible. Um, they have um, gaze fixation. They love to stare at you and they love to talk and smile. And there are autistic kids we found that have the opposite of the deletion. That is, they have a duplication and these are kids with autism, which is kind of the opposite of, it's the anti-Williams syndrome, if you like. They have gaze aversion, they are not friendly. Um, so here we have two fairly important um, examples that illustrate uh, contradictory things. A genetic lesion that's associated with with, with a variety of mental disabilities, um, seemingly without polarity. And here on chromosome 7, we have a lesion that gives you um, iconic, I, I, iconic phenotypic qualities. We'll, we'll just store that information. So this is, this, this, these were among the important um, findings early on based on copy number variation. Um, so there, were, there was a differential of about 5% uh, aughts in aughts over their siblings. Girls had a much higher uh, rate, almost twice the rate as boys. And the events in the girls were larger and knocked out many more genes, consistent with the idea that it's harder to give autism to a girl. Their resistance uh, is reflected at the genetic level. And there were recurrent loci. Then there was a parallel study um, done uh, at Columbia by our collaborators, uh, 
Yosef of uh, Sarah Gilman, and Dennis Vitkup, that did some computational analysis of the genes inside of these lesions. And I'll reduce that to um, a single intriguing finding, which I'm going to amplify on in the, in the rest of my lecture. I hope I'm doing OK with time. Yeah. Um, what Yosef and Vitkup did is what's called network analysis. They looked at whether there was evidence from the literature, from databases of protein-protein interactions, uh, co-expression and co-evolution. Um, what was the best candidate gene from every locus that we found? The copy number loci are, tend to be large. They hit many genes, more than one. So we didn't know what gene was being targeted. So they used these methods and, and came up with a, a purified list of the most likely genes to be causing autism. And that list overlapped in a surprising way with a set of genes that, was, that were being discovered um, by a fellow named Bob Darnell at Rockefeller. Um, Darnell was studying a syndrome called Fragile X, which is a mental retardation syndrome on the X chromosome, um, which has a high comorbidity, in which autism is a high comorbidity. One quarter of the children have autism. And he had discovered that fragile X protein, FMRP, binds to a subset of RNAs found in the brain. And he had a list of these. And he and, um, oh, I forget his, his name, Bear is his last name at MIT. Does somebody know? Mark, Mark Bear, thank you. Um, Mark Bear and he were, 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 had evidence that well, I think mostly Mark Baer had evidence that Fragile X and a gene um, upstream of Fragile X were involved in long-term neur neuronal depression. Is that, am I saying it correctly? As opposed to potentiation? Anyway, they were involved in neuroplasticity. So Darnell asked us, uh, did we find evidence that his list of genes overlapped with our autism candidate genes. And from this list, uh, there was a really very significant overlap. So we had a hypothesis that we were, we were, were uh, clearly an interesting hypothesis that autism and uh, genes involved in neuroplasticity were somehow linked. The next phase of the work, um, was to sequence the genomes of the Simons collection. And this work was split among three centers, uh, one at Cold Spring Harbor, one up at Yale under Matt State, and one uh, in Seattle under Evan Eichler. And our task was um, to apply these family analyses uh, to trios and quads. Again, the same formula. We would look at the child, and we'd look at the two parents. We'd ask, do we see a mutation in the child? that's not in either parent. Therefore, it was likely to be the result of new mutation. Generally, there was a, an unaffected sibling. So we could collect data on the un, un, unaffected sibling to get some base ground rates of mutation. Um, we sequenced the exome as opposed to the whole genome for some very sensible reasons. Number one, um, well, first of all, why did we sequence? Sequencing would point to a single gene whereas copy number changes didn't. Two, copy number was not explaining the large bulk of low-risk autism. Of course there would be point mutations, so we should look for them. The reason to look at the exome is that the exome is interpretable, whereas the rest of the, whole, rest of the genome would largely be uninterpretable, and there would be an enormous number of mutations, new mutations. One estimate would be about 200 new mutations per birth in the rest of the genome. The number of mutations in coding regions would be on the order of one per child. Okay. So the exome we would know how to interpret, and it was a lot cheaper, and the computational resources needed were less by a lot. And um, we were going to, we were about to study um, collectively close to 3,000 families, that's 12,000 individuals. So computational resources uh, would be taxed, even sequencing 
only the part of the genome encoding protein. So the, the collection was, uh, just to repeat, um, simplex. Uh, there was only one child in the family, um, preferably with an unaffected sibling. And when the collection was started, there was a bias to high-functioning autism. I'm not sure. I didn't participate in that decision, but that was the decision that was made. So, uh, you know, I, I have to give you at least one slide um, on sequencing, which is not all sequencings are the same. If somebody says they're sequencing something, you have to ask at what depth. Uh, sequencing is an error-prone process. If you don't sequence the same things multiple independent times, you don't know whether you're looking at sequence error. There's a 1% error or less at every base that you sequence. So you need lots of sequence in order to be able to infer things properly. We had fairly decent coverage uh, over the family that enabled us um, uh, we deduced that we could see about 60, about two-thirds of everything that there was to see in the exome. And the way we deduced that was so the coverage is uneven. There were regions where the coverage was excellent. At regions where the coverage is excellent, we make no errors. We could then measure our base rates for mutation at those. And then using all of our data, which had, was less deep, we could determine how much we were missing. So in the data that I'm going to describe to you, we make observations in genomes in which we have, we're missing about a third of the true positives. Our false positive rates are very low. And the coverage, having, we had high enough coverage to make the low uh, false positives very low. All right, so um, we detected, this is, the slides I'm going to show you, some of them are from different times in our study, so the numbers of patients and number of events we see is going to fluctuate. It would be a full-time job updating the slides. So the slides are made at various times of progress in the completion of this task. We're about, collectively, about two-thirds of the way through. Um, there are 754 new de novo mutations. One of the things that we were able to ascertain is that three-quarters of the time they're coming from the father. That's important. New mutations are coming preferentially from the father and strongly suggests that the mutations we're seeing are germline. That is, these mutations could have arisen in the child, but then how would the child have known when it made a mutation that it's mutating the father's genome and not the mother's? So we're looking at germline mutations. Almost all of them occur in one child, not in both. So that means that these are rare mutations in the germline. Otherwise, they'd be transmitted to both siblings a higher proportion of time. And we got an extremely accurate rate of mutation, um, which was, I believe it's uh, two mutations in, uh, or is that, yeah, two, I'll get this wrong. Two mutations, I think it's a half a mutation every 10 to the eighth base pairs, or something, something on that order, a very accurate number. And we observed the same rate of mutation in aughts and sibs. Now, you remember I told you that there's a higher rate of copy number mutations in aughts than in sibs, but a copy number mutation, and this is why we studied them, wipes out genes. Point mutation, very likely to have no effect, even in an exome. And there's the same rate in aughts and sibs. The distribution in families was Poisson. So we don't have families that have high rates of mutation. The copy, uh, the point mutations increase with the father's age, and they increase with the same slope as autism incidence. Okay? That's consistent with the idea that new mutation is driving the increased incidence found in families where the father has aged. All right. Now, um, here's a breakdown by type of mutation. Um, the t most neutral type of mutation would not change coding at all. Those are called synonymous mutations. And those were roughly equal in autism and their siblings. Missense mutation, which is where we expected to see signal, 
in our, in our autistic kids was equal between the autistic kids and their siblings. A study by Matt State showed signal here, but we haven't seen that signal. Mutations that are predicted to kill the gene, we call these killers, or loss of function, things that change splicing or that cause premature uh, termination of the RNA or cause a frame shift, which effectively causes premature termination. These are two to one more common in autism than the siblings. And this is the summation over these groups. Almost twice as many killer mutations in autism as in siblings. So that was rather gratifying. And here's that comparison as a bar graph. So these are the uh, ineffected in, in their siblings, and this is their differential for killers, loss of function mutations. For synonymous and missense, we, we didn't see signal. This is a pretty important fact. I'm going to um, maybe belabor it, but I don't think it can be belabored. It's um, extremely important. All right, and this is again repeating in bar graph form. These loss of functions break down into frame shift uh, nonsense and, and missense, all and everything in this category showing the same, the same ratio within statistical tolerance. All right, so let's sum these up. Over all the families, this is what we see. I'm going to talk about the differential that's observed in red. Copy number variation has a differential of about 6%, and I'm assuming in every case that we're missing about a third. So it could be contributing 9% the differential in autistic children. Loss of function, we're observing um, the differential is, is on the order of 8 to 9%, and we're missing another third on top of that. Missense, we don't see anything, but if we average our study with the other studies, we still don't see statistically significant signal, but it is impossible for missense not to be contributing. So we're taking at face value the ratios. And missense mutations can contribute to about 4%. You add another 2% because of it's not being observed. And we assume that there are other mutations that we can't see because they are occurring in the intron affecting splicing or, or at the promoter of the gene or of genes that we don't know about, perhaps microRNAs. And I'm arbitrarily guessing uh, that there are mutations of that type. And then there are other mutations within the exomes that we're just not able to see um, because the tools for the sequence analysis haven't been fully developed yet. In particular, I expect um, things called um, rearrangements to increase in amount. Altogether, I think conservatively we can guess that that's going to be about 10% of kids will, will there'll be a 10% differential in mutations of that type. So summing those, we get, we can predict that we're going to see about 38% of uh, children from the simplex collections have something in them. Our theory that I just presented earlier, on the assumption that only 60% of kids are really low risk, our prediction would, would have been 60%. So you can see that we're actually not very far off. There's a lot that we could be missing here, but we have seen a lot. This group we will eventually fill in. Um, it may be that we'll see more than we're predicting. I doubt that we'll see less. We may see more than we're, we're predicting. But there could be other events in low-risk families that are, in fact, environmental stresses of types or somatic mutations in the child. Um, or other things of that type which are not within our genetic model. But th the model has done extremely well, I think, in predicting uh, the incidence of new mutation in autistic children. All right, so now let's begin to think about what these numbers can tell us about the disorder. First thing we would like to know is um, how many genes are there that are sensitive to mutation that could cause autism. And we'll calculate that number in two different ways. The first way is to do um, what's frequently referred to as using the birthday paradox, which is not a paradox. If you've got 30 kids in a room, you can ask how many uh, kids have the same birthday, and with 50% chance, there will be one, uh, a pair of kids that have the same birthday. And that's because there are 365 possible birthdays. 
You could reverse the problem. You could land on some planet and not know the solar year, go to a classroom, ask how many kids have the same birthday, and given the number of kids, you could figure out the length of the solar year. Um, so from the number of coincidences, how, how often do we see the same gene hit by new mutation? We can make a calculation of the likelihood of the total number of target genes. We have to make some simplifying assumptions, uniform mutation rates, um, occurring in the population being the strongest assumption. If you do that calculation, on the data that we um, have published, we got a curve that looked like that. The most likely number of target genes was around 500, between 400 and 500. Um, as more data accumulated, these curves got sharper and sharper, but the uh, peak did not move terribly far from 500. So this method estimates there are about 500 autism genes. Genes that have hit will are associated with autism. I'll have a little bit more to say about that at the end. Um, we're now at the stage of having, um, well, this, this is, we have 253 genes that have been hit. About half of these are likely to be true positives and half are false positives. We don't know, without having it been seen more than once, we don't know what's what, but this is a, a, a fairly substantial list from which one can begin to make inferences. We know that they're half positive and half false because there's a two to one uh, increase in aughts over sibs. 13 were seen twice, four were seen three times, and one was seen four times. This is uh, the list of the genes, which may mean not a whole lot to you. I'll talk a little bit about them. Um, not about these, but about these in, in particular. So we now have a very large list of genes. It means that entitles us to uh, begin thinking about um, physiologic mechanisms uh, and a little bit more deeply about genetic me mechanisms, which I'll get to again. Um, we arrived at a very similar number by using a completely different method. Um, this method measures what's, what we call the mean vulnerability of the inherited transmitted ancestral genome. In other words, what are your odds of um, what are the genes which, if mutated, would cause you to have autism. People might have different vulnerabilities. So we can measure that from the uh, ratio of autism to SIBs, and we get an estimate that's close to 400. This, is a very, this in, 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 entails very different sorts of assumptions than the previous method. They both give us very similar numbers. All right, so this you probably cannot see from the back but this is now some more information about where targets fall. And I've put together several classes of genes, genes expressed in the brain. More than half of the genes in the genome are expressed in the brain. Genes that are called essential. These are genes that mainly mouse biologists, mouse modelers have determined these genes are essential, typically in the homozygous null state for viability. Uh, postsynaptic density genes that are expressed in the uh, postsynaptic uh, bodies of the brain. The FMR genes, these are the genes controlled by the fragile X protein, chromatin modulators, and genes known to cause Mendelian disorders. These are the genes. We ask, what is the distribution of synonymous or neutral mutations in these genes? And that gives us a uh, proportion. The proportion more or less follows the sum of the gene target sizes number of genes times their lengths. And um, this, is the this is the gene class we're going to look at, and these, are, these proportions are what we're going to use as our measuring stick when we look at the uh, presence of new mutations in genes of this class. Now, um, I want to point out uh, this column. It's very important. This is, from all of our data, we know how polluted a given gene category is in the human gene pool. By polluted, I mean how many rare variants are there? How many of those variants are killers? And the numbers are really quite interesting. Um, I believe this is um, 5,000 of the genes. Is that 5,000? I can't see very well. Yeah. 5,000 um, of genes expressed in the brain have 
killer mutations floating around in the human gene pool, um, and these are, these are rare. The expectation from neutral mutations is 6,000. So there's some evidence of protection from killer mutations in genes expressed in the brain. Essential genes um, are very uh, protected. The expectation was, I can't see, I don't know how you can't, I can't see this, was expected was uh, about 1,000. Is that right? About 1,000? And um, we see about 500. So half these genes, there are fewer than, than, than half of what we expected. Uh, Postsynaptic densities, I believe, are also protected, but not as much as these. Mendelian disease genes are protected about as much as the essential genes. Um, chromatin modifiers, likewise. But now let's look at the FMR genes. We expected to see 900, and we're seeing about 350. Um, these are very solid uh, numbers. The, the p-values that these numbers are different than these numbers is like astronomical. So the genes that are involved with Fragile X seem to be more protected even than many of the known essential genes. I think of, of all the stuff we've done, this is actually one of the, for me, this was one of the most profound findings. It, it suggests to me that these genes are not tolerated in the hemizygous state. We have two copies of genes. Therefore, there's room for you to get one that's not in good shape because you've got another gene that could express and, and, and spare you. These are um, very sensitive to killer mutations, suggesting to me that something about them makes them very gene dose sensitive. All right, now what's the distribution? I'll just tell you because I can't read this stuff. The, the bottom line is that there's an abnormal distribution of new mutations in the FMR targets. Um, roughly, um, we now estimate that roughly a quarter of the true positives, the true positive targets for autism, fall into the FMR category. The probability of that is, again, astrono astronomical, something in the order of 10 to the minus 18. I mean, it's huge. And also into uh, chromatin modifiers. There's a very high signal. There's not high signal in brain-expressed genes. So you could argue, oh, well, the coincidence with FMR is because they're expressed in the brain. But um, there's very little um, over, more than expected, in, in, for autism targets just in brain-expressed genes. So there's something going on here with these FMR genes and autism. Um, we're now done with the uh, factual phase. I'm going to try to uh, paste this together into a coherent story. First, I'm going to sum summarize. We showed that there's more than one positive risk class in autism, a low-risk class and a high-risk class. Any genetic model has to explain the high-risk class. Killer mutations are found in excess in autism as are copy numbers. Girls are disproportionately targeted by killer mutations. New mutation comes mainly from the father. New mutation in the father goes up with the age of the parent, um, as does risk, and their slopes match. Um, all this is tremendously supportive of the notion that mutation is a driver for low-risk autism. Killer events are hemizygous. I didn't give you the, the data for that, but these new mutations are occurring at a locus where the other allele looks fine, as far as we can tell. We very rarely, maybe there's one case where the other allele seemed to be affected. There are anywhere from three to 600 causative gene targets for these killers, and that's determined by two independent methods. And we have hundreds of candidate genes uh, with a 50% false positive rate. There's enrichment for things that modify chromatin, and for genes that, are, make, that make targets for regulation by fragile X. This is evidence for a convergence of mechanism in autism, which I hadn't expected to see. I had expected to see a multiplicity of genes, but with not very much rhyme or reason, except that they would affect nerve cells. <laughs>
but they seem to be affecting genes that can plausibly be made to be targets required for neuroplasticity, which is the cellular correlate of learning. So what are the remaining puzzles? Um, there are lots of them. We don't understand the gender bias. All we can say right now is it extends into the genetic arena. High-risk autism is largely unexplained. Well, it can be explained by our unified models, but there's no data yet to support the unified model. Um, and the reason is we shouldn't go into it. It's, it's, it's technical. There's a very large background. It's a hard problem. When we're done with low-risk autism, we will have the tools to go back and test if our models of the unified models are true. We can ask, what are the molecular mechanisms? What makes a gene a good target? Well, we already have this notion of neuroplasticity. What are the chromatin modifiers regulating? I believe that there's going to be, uh, very shortly, some exciting results that tie this in with this, um, which I'm not allowed to talk about. Um, and then, what makes a target gene vulnerable? Presumably, there are many other genes that play roles here, but they're probably not all vulnerable. That's a puzzle. So these are a set of puzzles. Very big puzzle is phenotypic variability and comorbidity. That is, the penetrance for many of the genetic, other genetic disorders, the penetrance for autism is low. Um, it's higher than, than normal, but it's low. So there's incomplete penetrance. And the same targets sometimes can produce schizophrenia, autism, mental retardation, obsessive behaviors, even Tourette syndrome. And other targets will give you a phenotype that's more or less reproducible. So there's a problem of the phenotypic variability. In particular, monozygotic twins, while they're concordant for having a problem, are often have very discordant phenotypes, monozygotic twins. And then there's the puzzle of why is there a gene dosage effect? Is it really quantitative that you, in all these cases, that the exact gene dosage matters? Or could there be what I call stochastic monoallelic expression? That is, in some cells of the brain, only one of the two alleles is expressed. And if it's expressing the wrong allele, you have a cell that's functionally homozygous. We know. So um, these are the puzzles that remain, and in my last breath, before telling you who's done all this work, I'll give you a hypothesis that knits all of this together. And that is, we like this idea of stochastic monoallelic expression. Um, the rationale for that is that the human community, the humans have grown up in, in communities or tribes. Diversity in the behavior of the tribe is of a great asset just like in the immune system and in a variety of other things, uh, diversity is important for survival. Mating is to increase diversity. Not that the environment is changing that radically, but for humans, certainly, that have, that have lived in multiple niches over a very volatile ecological time, diversity and adaptability are clearly important. So you can achieve that by having very important genes that are general regulators in the brain, regulating behavior cognition, you could make the person a mosaic. In this region, they express mom. In this region, they express dad. In another region, they might express, express both. So I find this fairly attractive. There is evidence from, uh, from Andrew Chess and Catherine Deloc's lab that maybe as much as 10% of genes are monolithically expressed. There are now more powerful methods to get at this number. It explains gene dosage, why a hemizygous could have a strong effect. It explains phenotypic variability, because if it's really random, sometimes you're knocking out the wrong gene in, in, in sets of neurons that give you rise to obsessive disorder or to schizophrenia or to autism. It explains what makes something um, a target is that it has this property, and it's in these networks. The chromatin modifiers being genes that do have general regulatory properties, these may be special classes that are fine-tuning our cognition and fine-tuning our behavior.
If that happens, we'll have some insight into the human as a learning machine. This being the highest rung of the, um, of the um, genetic neuron. Finally, um, it explains gender bias. If we postulate that in boys and girls, there's a difference in the monoallelic expression pattern. Delac had found differences that were based on gender. Um, and it makes sense in the context of things that you might want to use this mechanism to give uh, sexual dimorphism to behaviors and to um, the propensity of the different genders to tolerate risky behavior. Okay, so that's um, my final slide. That's my final large idea. Um, the next slide gives credit to a very large number of people. Uh, first, our collaborators at Columbia, Dennis Vitkup, Sarah Gilman, at Albert Einstein, Kenny Yee, who was um, on the uh, faculty here in, in applied math. And I met him through, um, uh, through Jim Simons, and that was, um, that, was a, that was a great boon to our work to meet, to meet Kenny. Uh, people at Wash U in, C in St. Louis that did a lot of the sequencing, half of the, the early sequencing. And our competitors and, 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 and forced collaborators, um, Matt State, Evan Eichler, and Oh dear. Well, ah, phew, good. Uh, Mark Daly at the Broad, generous support from the Simons Foundation through Safari, and at early times, National Institute of Mental Health. And then the people at Cold Spring Harbor, first uh, Yvonne Yosefif, who was a Columbia graduate student who came to Cold Spring Harbor, and he ran the pipeline and did a lot of the very heavy lifting. Mike Rodimus, who organized the wet bench side of things, a large technical staff, some of whom are mentioned here, Linda Rogers, uh, Nessa Hacker, Julie Rosenbaum, who came from Stony Brook, uh, Ma Bay, and Jen Troge. And then Don Levy, uh, who did a lot of the uh, mathematical modeling, and a whole bunch of other very important people. Um, special mention to Dick McCombie, who set up the Genome Center at Woodbury uh, for the lab. That's, um, that completes my talk, and I hope there are questions.